welcome to the RimWorld DLC Rundown. We'll be taking a quick look at what you can expect to see from Royalty. As RimWorld is a game that rarely goes on sale and the amount of DLC is ever growing, not everybody is in the position to buy everything in one go. As such, you'll likely want to make sure that any DLC you do pick up will give you the content that you're really excited about and adds the most value to your game. Royalty was the first DLC released for RimWorld and features some major gameplay additions. You have the Empire Faction, the Title System, Psionic Abilities, better known as Psycasting, new Mechanoid Threats, a whole bunch of new quests, new weapons, armour, body parts, utility items, all with associated research, a new way to win the game and over an hour of new music. To put a TLDR nice and early for you, or a TLDW I guess, Royalty is a DLC you'd want to buy if you're craving more versatility from gameplay. It greatly expands on what individual pawns can do and allows you to better specialise them in both work and combat roles with new items and body parts included. Compared to the other DLC, this is by far the most straightforward edition. It doesn't throw a lot of confusing menus or concepts at you. It simply expands upon the base game in a satisfying and engaging way. Okay, so we're going to need to break down all of these additions to properly cover royalty. Let's start with the namesake of the mod, the Empire and Nobility system. The Empire itself is the highest tech faction in vanilla Rimworld, at least as of this recording. They operate under a hierarchy of titles and bestow powers on those that advance within their ranks. To advance within nobility, you'll need to earn honour. But what exactly is honour? Honour is different from goodwill, in that it's earned by individual pawns and only matters to the Empire. You can have a neutral or positive relation with the Empire whilst earning honour, but angering them will lock you out of engaging with the honour system until you've restored the peace. As such, if you're planning on using honour in a colony, you'll want to buddy up with the Empire and learn to suck eggs. So what does this honour do exactly? What's it used for? It's a currency to increase your ranking within the nobility or call in favours. Honour can be earned on pawns via quest rewards or by exchanging gold or prisoners with an imperial trader known as a royal tribute collector. They occasionally appear as long as you aren't hostile with the Empire. A freeholder is the lowest title and is automatically granted when a pawn earns even a single point of honour. Yeoman is the next rank and is granted via a bestowing ceremony. When a ceremony is called for, a bestower from the Empire will arrive with their own personal guard and proceed to a throne room, if one is available. If not, they'll proceed to the most beautiful room in the colony. From here, they'll perform a ritual to grant the honoured pawn a new title, spending that pawn's honour to reach the new rank. Ranks can be skipped if a pawn accumulates enough honour to leapfrog titles, and it will still apply the bestowing bonuses of the lower ranks that were bypassed. So what other ranks do you have? You've got Yeoman, which costs 6 honour, Acolyte, which costs a further 6, Knight or Dame, depending on your gender, which costs 8, Praetor, which costs 10, Baron or Baroness for 14, and finally Count or Countess for 20. These costs are per rank, so to jump from a freehold to a Knight, bypassing Yeoman and Acolyte, you'd need 20 honour on the pawn. Upon reaching the rank of Knight, that 20 honour would be spent, providing the title but dropping the pawn back down to an empty stockpile. As such, earning honour is a fairly lengthy process, with each additional rank essentially prestiging your account for a shiny new badge and making you start the climb all over again. Only royal titles actually have value, unlike the best virgin award for hitting max prestige. This leaves it up to you if you'd rather have a single, bloated noble sucking up all of the honour possible and using other colonists as footstools, I apologise for nothing! Or if you'd prefer to share the wealth and have everybody get a little something something, living in a colony of lower class nobility that treats one another as equals in decadence. If this all sounds a bit too easy, it's now that I'll point out that titles also come with requirements. The higher a pawn rises, the more demanding they become, and the less work they'll be willing to do. Some pawns are also considered to be conceited, if they're recruited from the Empire faction, or have an Empire background, or if they have the traits greedy, jealous or abrasive, they're much more demanding of others respecting their royal title. 
suffering greater mood penalties if they're not met, and refusing to do certain types of work at much lower ranks than normal nobles. These are basically colonists with a silver spoon in their mouth and a stick up their ass. You'll grow to despise them. You can expect nobles to progressively refuse to clean, then haul, then mine or do plant work. They'll eventually refuse to cook, build, craft or look after animals. The highest ranks of nobility wish only to spend their days as doctors, wardens, hunters, artists or researchers. As such, you might want to plan ahead with any royal pawns so that they won't become locked out of their own passion, or their most valuable skill. And all of this is only covering what they're willing to do for work. They'll also demand increasingly impressive throne rooms, with braziers, beautiful flooring, columns, drapes and musical instruments. They want more expensive bedrooms, with gold inlaid beds, dresses, drapes, end tables and a huge footprint. They progressively demand better food, refusing simple and eventually even fine meals, only accepting lavish meals, insect jelly, meat, berries, ambrosia, chocolate and beer. And then to add insult to injury, they'll require specific clothing to be satisfied. New prestige variants of high-tech armour, formal wear, crowns or new LTEX gear. It becomes a lot to keep them happy with colony wealth being forced to bloat to accommodate their ever-expanding demands. I'll let you get back to your, uh... dinner party! Uh -huh. So what benefit is there to having nobles, then? Why go through all of this? You have four reasons. Speeches, sidecasting, permits, and trade. Speeches can be given from the Praetor rank onwards, with a lower cooldown for higher ranks. The noble will take their place in the throne room and waffle on for four or so in-game hours. The speech can go one of four ways. Terrible, uninspiring, encouraging or inspirational. The negative outcomes lower all participants' mood and decrease their opinion of the speaker, whilst the positive outcomes improve mood and opinion, with inspirational speech giving every listener a 5% chance of gaining a random inspiration. Psycasting will have its own little section in the video shortly, but to briefly mention it here, for every new rank that you obtain, you are granted an additional level of Psy Link, which comes with an associated Psy Cast, hitting the max caster level of 6 when you reach the title of Count. Permits are a system unique to working with the Empire. Starting at Acolyte, you are granted one Permit point for each rank you gain. These can then be spent for unique boons, that operate on long cooldowns. You have the option to call in labourers, troopers, request a resource drop, ask for transport shuttles or even call in an aerodrome strike. All of these abilities take between 40 to 60 days to recharge, so shouldn't be used lightly. However, in a pinch you can skip the cooldown entirely by spending honour to bypass it, meaning that a noble pawn with an excess of spare honour can turn the tide of a colony with just a snap of their fingers. Certain permits are locked behind higher ranks or have a prerequisite unlock, allowing you to focus different nobles in specific directions. One may be a bombardier, others may call for backup, there could be a noble that has the right connections and just gets whatever resources you need. Thematically, this is fantastic. And finally, you've got trading with the Empire. They typically have access to some of the highest quality and most expensive gear in the game. At the rank of knight or dame, you'll be able to trade with imperial caravans and settlements, which otherwise wouldn't even grant you an audience. They just shout vague insults from the city walls. Now go away or I shall taunt you a second time. Upon hitting Baron or Baroness, this extends to Imperial Orbital Traders, saving you the legwork and the risk of carrying trade goods and silver to visit the nearest Imperial city. As nobles are expected to trade and give royal speeches, you might want to consider who gets priority for honour and titles, as extremely social pawns with a decent trade price impact will be far more beneficial when dealing with such large value items, and they're also more likely to hit a positive outcome in a royal speech. Although, as is often shown in real life, people with practically negative social skills can somehow make this work. So, sidecasting. It's a big benefit of nobility. Whilst nobility is one of the ways of earning sidecasting, it isn't the only way. Royalty introduces three potential paths for you to take. You can earn items called Silent Neuroformers via quests, or by stealing them from a bestower that turns up to perform the ceremony on nobles. 
just be aware that, rather unsurprisingly, the Empire don't take kindly to being robbed. Neuroformers grant one Psylink level when used, to the max level of six. As mentioned before, there are bestowing ceremonies that will increase Psylink levels by one, unless you're skipping ranks, in which case they'll increase the Psylink level by however many ranks you would have gained from the start to end point. And finally, you have the option of using the Anima Tree. Meditating at the Anima Tree feeds it with psychic energy, allowing it to slowly grow grass around the base. When 20 tiles of grass have been grown, you can perform a ritual to commune with the tree. This consumes the nearby grass and grants the chosen pawn a Psylink level. Speaking about the Anima Tree brings up an additional point about Psycasting, which is meditation. Psycasting uses something called Psyfocus as fuel. Psyfocus is gained from meditation. Each pawn is given different types of meditation they're able to engage with based on their backstory or traits. The Anima Tree is a natural type of meditation. Natural meditation is normally restricted to tribal backstories. As such, using the Anima Tree to gain Psylinks isn't an option for all colonies, as many will simply lack the harmony to commune with nature in a meaningful way. You also have Morbid, which is typically a type for psychopathic pawns, or those with bloodlust or cannibalistic traits, which will see them wanting to meditate at grave sites. Artistic is the most common type to find on non-tribal pawns, with colonists best suited to gain psi focus around sculptures. Minimal is a very niche focus type, purely reserved for ascetic pawns, which will see them meditate at walls because they don't need anything else. Flame meditation is for pyromaniacs, and as you'd expect, it sees them focusing on any source of fire. He told me to burn things. Uh -huh. The final type of meditation is dignified, which is used by nobility. If your pawn is granted a title and is working their way up the ranks of the Empire, they'll be bestowed the ability to meditate at dignified objects, such as thrones. So that's Psy Levels and Meditation. What are we going to spend this Psy Focus on and how are we limited? The limiting part is easy to cover. Neural Heat. Casting what is essentially magic using your brain is an exhausting process and causes the pawn to accumulate unstable energy internally. Neural Heat capacity increases as the pawn's Psylink level does, so more adept casters can better mitigate this heat accumulation. Should casters wish to bypass their limits, they can exceed neural heat capacity at the risk of a psychic breakdown. The further they exceed their limitations, the higher the risk of a break and the more likely the pawn is to experience a more severe break. This risk is indicated by the marks on the neural heat bar when overcasting and the pitch of the warning noise played when doing so. Minor breaks will lower consciousness by 25% for 1-5 to five days, Major will hit consciousness by 50% for 6-10 to 10 days, and a total breakdown renders the pawn unconscious from anywhere between 11 to 15 days. Okay, 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 for the love of god, what are we casting? When you rank up, you'll be granted one random psycast from the pool at the appropriate level. You've got six level one psycasts, four at level two, four at level three, five at level four, five at level five, and five at level six. Many of these psycasts are copied over into vanilla psycast expanded, which I have done an extensive breakdown on in another video. If you'd like to see all of the psycasts in much more detail, including use cases, the link is in the description. With level 1, you have Burden, a targeted slow. Pain Block, targeted psychic anesthesia. Stun, which completely locks down a selected target for a brief duration. Chunk Skip, which relocates nearby chunks or slag to act as cover. Solar Pinhole, which illuminates the targeted area like a torch and provides warmth if cast indoors. And Word of Trust, which massively reduces a prisoner's resistance. At level 2, you have Blinding Pulse, which halves sight in an AoE. Water Skip, which can be used to put out fires. Neural Heat Dump, which clears the Psycaster's heat by putting a target ally into a coma. Word of Joy, which provides 30 mood at the cost of 20% consciousness, and is classed as a hostile action if used on visitors. At level 3, you have Beckon, which stops ranged attackers from firing and makes them walk towards the caster. Chaos Skip, which randomly scatters the selected target anywhere within 7 to 25 tiles of the starting location. 
Vertigo Pulse, which makes all targets within the AoE dizzy and very likely to stop moving or being able to act as they have to vomit, and Word of Love, which increases the opinion between pawns. It can be cast back to back to encourage a relationship between the targets. At level 4 you have Smoke Pop, which works like the utility item, reducing accuracy and blocking any turrets. Skip, which allows you to move the target anywhere within range. Focus, which improves sight, hearing and movement for a short duration. Wall Raise, which makes instant high cover or can be used to block pathing. And Word of Serenity, which targets pawns that are currently mentally broken and puts them into a coma, stopping anything from psychotic wonders to murderous rages. At level 5 you have Berserk, which turns a pawn hostile to all nearby targets. Flash Storm, which creates a very localised storm in a target area. Invisibility, which completely obscures the target to any enemies. Word of Inspiration, which makes the target inspired. And Farskip, which transports the caster and any nearby allies to the target at a distant location. Very useful for returning home after travelling to a quest site on the world map. And finally, with level 6, you have Mass Chaos Skip, which is Chaos Skip with an AoE. Skip Shield, which totally nullifies ground level projectiles from going in or out of it. Manhunter Pulse, which is a massive AoE target that turns all animals inside completely feral. And Neuroquake, a massive AoE that turns all impacted targets berserk, with a very small safe zone around the caster. This also puts the caster into a 5 day coma, and has dramatic mood and faction relation penalties due to the disturbing nature of the cast. With just a quick rundown of the casts, I'm sure why you can see that Psycasting is so impactful, especially at higher levels. It's able to turn entire fights around with one or two well placed uses. Most of these also scale with Psychic Sensitivity, so pawns that are hypersensitive are likely to be much more impactful casters, extending durations, range or severity of casts where appropriate. Ok ok, that's enough about mental magic, what about the metal monsters? With royalty you get a new type of threat included which are mechanoid clusters. They behave somewhat like a mix of a siege and a drop pod raid combined. Mechanoids will deploy on the map with barricades, walls and structures, but they lay dormant until you disturb them, meaning that as long as you keep your pawns away you have time to assess and prepare for the threat. To make sure that you don't just completely ignore a mech cluster, they frequently land with an object known as a condition causer. They are the same buildings that you'll be given quests to go out into the world and deal with. Things like EMI dynamos, climate adjusters, defoliators, psychic droners or suppressors, sunblockers, you get the gist. As well as a mech threat, you may also have unique structures to deal with. Things like high shields that can block mortars, low shields that will block ranged weapons, proximity activators so you can't just sneak to get into a better position. Unstable power cells which will cause an explosion if damaged. All of this makes for a very fun challenge. You have to assess what's landed, plan the best course of action, how you can approach the threat and what are the priority targets. Not to mention, these are also great for resources. A lovely big delivery of steel and maybe even some free, somewhat volatile power cells. Or, as usually happens for me, Whilst you're preparing to deal with this threat, a caravan will decide to wander right through the middle of the mech cluster, or a raid will decide to go and poke the bear for you, meaning that if they don't deal with the mechs, you're next, round 2. I briefly said that some of the buildings dropped with mech clusters are also present in quests. With royalty enabled, quests are something that you'll get a lot more of. Not only do you have more variety of quests to actually do, you're offered them more frequently. Without royalty by default, you get one quest every 10 days or so. With royalty, you get two every 12, meaning over the course of one year you have around 6 quest opportunities in vanilla and 10 if you've got royalty enabled. Not only that, but royalty includes more new quests than base game has in total. You have a chase noble quest, deserter quests, refugees and subsequent refugee betrayal offers, monument building, bandit camp attacks via a shuttle, forced weather, hospitality opportunities, pawn lending, rewarded combat, shuttle crashes, condition causer events, noble ceremonies and title inheritance. 
all of these offer a great deal more engagement within and outside of colony life. You'll have pawns to protect, threats to travel to deal with, known dangers, unknown dangers, all of which come with a healthy opportunity to earn some new rewards, honour, or simply get your hands on some more prisoners and resources. If you find the quest system in Vanilla Rimworld was lacking, royalty will have you covered in spades. So new rewards, that's gotta mean new items. Yep, a whole bunch of them. Of all of the DLCs, at time of recording anyway, which is pre-anomaly, I'd say royalty includes the most items, but not the most structures. A lot of the items included with royalty are locked behind research that requires items called tech prints. These will unlock the ability to begin researching new projects, that will in turn unlock the fancy new items. Tech prints are obtained as quest rewards or can be purchased from traders. You have new armour, the heaviest variant of spacer gear known as cataphract. New variants on old armour, like the grenadier suit which combines a marine armour with a frag grenade launcher, offering slightly less protection than baseline marine gear. There's locust armour which merges recon armour with a jump pack, again at the cost of protection, allowing the wearer to perform long range jumps across the map provided there's no walls or mountains blocking their path. You're given the prestige versions of cataphract, marine and recon armour, helmets included, which cost more to build compared to their standard variants but provide additional bonuses for sidecasters when worn, and satisfy a noble's clothing requirements, making them almost essential on a nobility run. You have a new piece of headgear called the gunlink, which provides no armour to the head but offers a shooting accuracy buff instead. This buff is most noticeable on pawns that have a very low shooting skill, with it losing its potency as pawns become naturally more proficient with ranged weapons, although it never becomes obsolete. As well as armours, you're also given a new form of gear called Eltex, coming with helmets, skullcaps, robes, shirts and vests. Eltex gear is designed to buff sidecasting statistics while offering very little in the way of protection. It does satisfy a noble's clothing requirements, being extremely rare and quite exclusive, but it's hard to reliably keep an entire set of Eltex gear on hand as you'll need to barter or find it as quest rewards constantly for a full outfit. You also have some clothing designed for royalty that will keep them happy and usually apply solid social bonuses. These are berets, coronets, crowns, ladies hats, top hats, capes, corsets, formal shirts and formal vests. You get a whole host of artificial body parts, a nuclear stomach that drastically lowers the need for food, at the cost of occasionally giving the pawn cancer. Just gonna get a little bit of cancer, Stan. Tell mom it's okay. A reprocessor stomach, which provides a lesser effect of a nuclear stomach without the risk of a little bit of cancer. And a sterilizing stomach, which removes the risk of food poisoning. You have a mind screw, which causes the pawn constant pain, because why not? There's a circadian assistant which decreases the need for sleep by 20% and a circadian half cycler which removes the need for sleep entirely, at the cost of being permanently reduced in consciousness. Hidden weapons can be installed on pawns, elbow blades, hand talons or knee spikes, because what you really want is more unpredictability in your melee damage. Aesthetic noses can be installed to increase beauty, aesthetic shapers can be installed to increase beauty, and you can also give pawns love enhancers to make their bedroom games something that bards write about. Gastro analyzers can be installed to increase cooking speed. Immuno enhancers are around to boost the recovery rate from any and all ailments. Learning assistants exist, which boost global learning by a factor of 20%, or you could use a neural calculator, which increases research speed by 20%. Venom fangs and venom talons exist if you want to try and kill an enemy with toxic buildup. Just be sure that the pawn isn't also wielding a melee weapon, otherwise they're likely to kill someone outright before the toxic gets to any meaningful amount. These will also make social fights a complete disaster. You can put armour directly inside of your pawns now, with tough skin, armour skin and stone skin glands, providing increasing amounts of protection at the cost of move speed and beauty. You have drill arms and field hands to boost mining and plant work. With two drill arms, a pawn can literally take down an entire mountain in a single day. There are psychic harmonizers, so you can share the mood of the pawn that it's installed in. 
This allows you to make the famous happy little potato that acts like a beacon of joy to all of those around them. Psychic readers boost negotiation and trade values. Psychic sensitizers can make casters biblically powerful whilst also completely crippling them if a psychic drone happens. You have some new utility items. The jump pack which is a standalone version of the utility included in the locust armour allowing a pawn to rocket themselves around the map when needed. A low shield pack which can save colonists inside when ranged combat goes bad, blocking all incoming shots for a short time. And there's an orbital mech cluster targeter, just for those times when you want to drop an entire mech raid on waiting enemies. And hope that they both deal enough damage to each other so that you aren't going to end up causing your own downfall. There are new weapons. Axes, Warhammers and an Eltex Staff which boosts psychic sensitivity like the Eltex gear as well as a new tier of Ultratech melee. Mono swords, plasma swords and Zeus hammers all of which can potentially also become persona weapons. Persona weapons are rare rewards from quests and sometimes appear on traders or at imperial cities. They bond to the wielder and may refuse to be used by anybody else. Typically they have a very high item quality, dramatically boosting their DPS and they'll come with additional traits from a list of 19 potentials. They can boost or dampen psychic sensitivity, buff or hurt the wielder's mood, gain psi focus or mood on killing blows, lose mood on killing blows, lose mood for going too long without a killing blow, boost meditation rate or neural heat recovery, cause the wielder to feel no pain, boost the wielder's move speed, increase the wielder's hunger rate, massively impact the wielder's mood if they dare to use another weapon or simply not care about whoever wields them at all. There are a few structures included in the DLC too. Landing beacons if you'd like to designate a spot for shuttles to land. You have fine floors, both carpet and stone. Braziers for fancy lighting. Drapes for additional beauty. A harp, harpsichord and piano to fulfil the need of any royals. Thrones, both standard and grand nature shrines both small and large, meditation spots to guide pawns to specific locations, and a rare and elusive animus stone which is the strongest natural focus in the game without the benefit of growing anima grass for silic rituals. It's a lot. It's why I said at the start of the video that royalty is just a wedge of new gameplay possibilities. Mechanically it does add quite a bit but the main additions to me are the sheer variety of items for pawns. You'll find a lot of raiders coming in with interesting body parts that you can borrow and you'll have new ways of dealing with them thanks to the side casting. It's great. It doesn't drown the game in complex mechanics or completely drag away from the core experience that is Rimworld. This is seasoning, not an entirely new dish. I should quickly mention that you have two new diseases included with Royalty 2. Lovely lovely diseases. As they typically come into play with some of the new quests you're more likely to find that visitors will appear with these. They are Blood Rot and Paralytic Abasia. Blood Rot simply requires tending every so often to keep the severity of the illness down to avoid any complications. Bad tends will let it rise, good tends will push it down. It's essentially a pawn that needs dialysis. Paralytic Abasia strips a pawn of all movement, making them bedbound, but not unconscious, so they still appreciate conversation whilst recovering. Abasia typically has an extremely long recovery time but it can be removed instantly at the cost of 10 Glitter World Medicine. It also has an extremely small chance every day to simply disappear. We got better. And finally there's a new ending introduced in Royalty, the aptly named Royal Ascent. Upon reaching the top rank of the hierarchy, Count, you're able to invite the High Stellarch themselves to your colony for 12 days. You'll be required to house them in a suitable room and tend to their needs. They land with their own personal guard that are also ranked at night, demanding accommodation that goes with it. And all you need to do now is survive for 12 days. Sounds simple enough, right? There are three ways you can fail this quest. 1. The Empire becomes hostile towards you, for whatever reason. If you misplace a Psycast, maybe friendly fire, or you fail at another quest while this is active, it's going to cost you. Number two, the High Stellarch is unhappy for too long. 
Similar to a quest where you accommodate a noble, if the Stellarch is unimpressed or miserable, they'll just up and leave, flipping you the bird as the shuttle flies away. And three, the High Stellarch dies. This obviously fails the quest. Failing the quest doesn't mean that you can't try again though. It takes around 20 days for the Stellarch to forgive and forget, or to be replaced, and they'll request a royal visit again. After all, it couldn't happen twice, right? So what happens over these 12 days? Raids. Lots and lots and lots of raids. The High Stellarc draws quite a crowd and not everybody is as buddy-buddy with the Empire as you've declared yourself to be. People are desperate to claim the head of the top dog and the notoriety that goes with it. You'll have breaches, sieges, drop pods, all out assaults. You'll be hammered non-stop. Remember that while big psychasts like Neuroquake will basically win any fight, it will also upset the Empire, so you need multiple solutions for every attack to be able to survive. If you manage to make it 12 days and keep his lord or ladyship happy, you'll be offered a way off planet, to join the Imperial Court and live as you see fit for the rest of your days. Congratulations! And that is royalty. At the time of writing and recording, royalty, ideology and biotech are released, with Anomaly right around the corner. I'd say if you're looking to buy your first DLC, whilst a lot of it depends on what you're after, I would still rank biotech highest right now. Royalty offers a great deal of content, but biotech also offers flexibility within the colony due to different xenotypes, and a lot of content. Ideology is a different kind of recommendation. Whilst royalty and biotech both offer items, structures, gameplay, Ideology offers the ability to better control and form your colony, what they'll aspire to be, what they do and don't agree with. It's much more focused on deepening the narrative and giving you full control over how your pawns act and react to situations. So where does this leave royalty? Well, if you like the sound of psychasting, which is a large part of this DLC, that might tip the scales in favour of getting royalty over biotech. If you're strictly looking for more content, get biotech. If you're desperate to force everybody in the colony to be a nudist cannibal that worships a god called Bob Ross, you're going to want ideology. Personally, I'd say biotech, then royalty, then ideology. As for anomaly, well, we just don't know yet. But um, It looks to be a very involved DLC though, which likely means it'll be quite heavy on content. The question is, does it provide as much of a foundation, like royalty and biotech do? To stand on its own as a recommendation? Or is it more of a niche addition that won't necessarily be beneficial to every colony you play? I guess time will tell. I'll be covering the other DLC soon and the mod rundown will be back to normal as soon as the kinks with 1.5 have been ironed out. If you're enjoying content like this, drop a like and don't forget to subscribe or comment, all the algorithm stuff. If you'd like to support me further, a link to Patreon is included in the description. You can name your own price in the supporter tier which starts from just £1 a month and gets your name in the credits of videos like this. Thanks for watching folks. If you have any mods you'd like to see a full breakdown for, or suggestions of mods you'd like to see covered, feel free to leave them in the comments, I might get around to them. I'll be back again soon with another RimWorld mod rundown. Wherever you are in the world, enjoy the rest of your morning, afternoon or evening. Take care.